the still life with plaster cast around 1895. Maybe we could start in this case by talking about the subject matter. It's a still life. It's a still life of an artist's studio. His own studio, of course. Um, well, not all still lifes are so self-referential in that way. This is therefore art about art, you could say. It's an art that takes you to the place where art was made. That's a sort of self-referential feedback loop or self-consciousness of art about art. I suppose I've already been saying that sans painting, you're very aware of them as made objects. You're, you're looking at it as art, as a two-dimensional design rather than just as um, um, an illusion of the three-dimensional world. So already there's this idea that you're aware of it as art. Um, well, what is in the artist studio? Well, most prominently a sculpture. It's a painting of a sculpture. Well, that's art about art already. Sculpture of a Cupid. Um, Cezanne himself thought that this Cupid sculpture was by Puget, P-U-G-E-T, uh, 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 an artist sort of quite well known in that region, sort of Baroque era artist. In fact, it's uh, more recently been suggested it's um, based on the uh, work of another artist called du Duquesnoy. Um, it's really a, a, not a, uh, a well-known name, but anyway, France, Francois Duquesnoy. He made drawings after that uh, plaster cupid, which he had in his own studio. It's still there today. If you ever get the chance to go to Aix and to visit Cezanne's studio, you'll see that plaster cupid is, is there. It recently made a little visit of its own. It went to London to sit beside this painting, which is in the Courtauld Institute Gallery for an exhibition, and then went back home. So a painting of a sculpture, art about art, also a, a painting of a painting. But actually it's a painting of a painting of a sculpture. Oh, well that's more art about art about art, you know, so self-referentiality. The sculpture is of a, a subject called a flayed man. Uh, that is means a, a human figure, but without any skin, so the muscles are laid bare. Flaying means to, to take the skin off something. Now that sounds very violent, and it would be if one experienced it, but such images were common in art schools, you know, for you to be able to study the musculature of the human body. So again, it, the, the subject is about, it's about art, you could also say it's about death, you know, because that's a, an act of violence. So maybe there are three different subjects here in this painting. There's a subject of art, a meta-subject if you like, uh, there's a subject of death, and there's a subject behind the sculpture. The sculpture actually is of Cupid, he's the, uh, you know, God associated with love, so the the erotic or the love is is the other subject. You know, are there any other greater subjects for art than love and death? You know, maybe not. But they're both represented in a distanced way by Cezanne. Eventually, you get to love, or eventually you get to de death. But it's not a, a presented in the raw and direct way it is in his very early works that we that we saw, like the murder, the first one we saw. So it it, it fits in with this view I'm presenting, following Mayor Shapiro, of the artist as um, trying to kind of control or find mediate the emotional feelings of his earlier work through through art.
thinking now about the compositional structure. Well, we, we tried this sort of trick with other paintings, tried to sort of analyze it to see how the image is structured. We can do the same thing here. Um, with a still life, it's a little bit different from a landscape because you can manipulate the details of it. You can organize it as you want. You can't move a tree or you can't move a mountain especially, but you can move a, an onion or an apple. So uh, Cezanne was very much that kind of artist who wanted to carefully arrange objects. So it's not an accident that the sprouting onion is off the edge of the table, thereby breaking the strength of this line of the edge of the table. I think he's deliberately arranged it that way. It's not just that the art um, changes reality to, to order it. He can actually order reality to serve the needs of the painting. Same here, this sprout of this onion also go, breaks this line of the edge of the table on this side. Although here, interestingly, the sprout starts exactly at that point where the, the line is. So you know, it's all thought out, surely. Uh, the, there's a canvas against the wall and the, if you try and join up the top edge of the canvas it doesn't seem to quite work. This side of the canvas seen one side of the cupid and this side of the canvas seen the other side of the cupid, they don't seem to cohere. It seems to be slightly different viewpoints on, on each one. Well what's going on there? Well it, that's partly as I was saying earlier today about how the act of painting is bringing information together from different viewpoints. So Cezanne is letting you know that, having shifting viewpoints, letting you know that. But it also has, at a formal level, it helps to create these accents that, that of the strong vertical edges of the two sides of the canvas that contrast, interestingly, with the more curved forms of the cupid itself. Surely part of the reason why he's chosen this cupid is because of its lovely curved shapes. So he's bringing that, that out in the way he treats it, the curves of the curls of the hair, of the chubby body. So you see, and then contrasting it with the straight lines of the canvas, visually very close to it, spatially disparate, but visually very close. Um, yeah, the, the curved forms of the cheeks follow down the form of the body, series of curves. Even in the, the leg, the, there's uh, you know this series of curves and it's followed on below the leg by these curves of the apples that are neatly arranged in a row below. There's something strange here, even halfway down the thigh there's a curve. The shadow creates a kind of curve. Uh, now, for years I, I, I used to talk about this in lectures and I would say, well, that's, that must be something that uh, the artist has imposed on the painting, you know, imposed on reality, create a, a sense of a curve there because it suits the composition of the, the work itself. But when I eventually went to Cezanne's studio, which was preserved at his death with all the objects in it, and I saw the actual sculpture, I noticed actually, yes, it does have halfway down its thigh, a kind of strange fold of skin, sort of baby baby skin or baby kind of features, whatever, how you want to call it. Uh, so it is something there in, in reality, not just within the world of the, the painting. Uh, so some of the compositional ordering, shifting the shifting viewpoint is there with the floor as well. The angle of the table and the angle of the floor seem, our viewpoint on them seem different. The floor seems sort of raised up strangely. Is this another apple? If so, it seems very big to be so far back in space. It's the same size as the apples in, in the foreground, isn't it? So uh, anyway, the raising up of the background floor like that, it helps us to see two-dimensional space. It prevents 
a hole opening up in the two-dimensional design of the painting, which would be the case if this floor wasn't raised up in that way. So interesting diagonals created all over. Thank you. Another play between, so there's constant sort of play between two-dimensional design and three-dimensional space. He wants both and he's sort of juggling them both together. An interesting aspect of that is this blue cloth which is here on the table underneath this plate and yet it seems to go all the way back to quite a deep space here uh, in the middle ground of the, of the image. So that blue cloth has a, an effect of linking foreground and middle ground and therefore of, of flattening out space somewhat, creating a sense of two-dimensional design. There's something odd about this, actually. If you look at this bit of, of the painting here, the two apples on the fold of the, uh, of, of the cloth, and then you look at this painting, and you look at the two apples on the fold of cloth. Actually, it's very similar. This is the still life with peppermint bottle. Here is that same cloth. A lot of the, one of the interesting things in the still life is that the same objects which are there in his studio come back again and again, just as the mountain comes back again and again, these objects that Remember that he's, he knows really well. He doesn't just know what they look like. He knows what they feel like. You know, he's, he can hold them in his hand. They reappear as actors. So what is happening? You know, it, it may be what we're seeing is that painting stacked against the wall, the corner of it, either finished or in process or something like that. So he's making a kind of blur between painting reality and painted images of reality. This must be actual cloth. Well, it's not. It's a painting of an actual cloth. But it's a painting of an actual cloth and a painting of a painting of an actual cloth. You know, so... <laughs> uh, but at some point, one becomes the other, doesn't it? It's well, somehow that they, they kind of blurred the, the linkage. So there are two paintings within the painting and one sculpture within the painting and one painting of a sculpture within a painting. Well, there are, there are other paintings, but they're turned against the wall. We don't know. Maybe there's painting on the other side of these. Maybe they're just ba bare canvas waiting to be painted. So I think y you need to look at it in a formalistic way to understand the painting. But I suppose what I'm also saying is that it's not just about forms and colors. It is about meanings. Uh, it's art about art. We're meant to be self-conscious about the process of art because even the subject matter helps us to, towards that. Here's just uh, an old photo of his studio. Um, yeah, you can see actually a on the wall one of his drawings or a print after one of his drawings of that Cupid statue. It's a little tiny thing. Here it sits. The skulls appear in some paintings as well. Typical s still life object from the 17th century. We've met this before, this fruit bowl. Actually, it looked rather elongated when we met it, the compotier fruit bowl. But it's not. It's a perfect circular form. Items of furniture as well reappear from one painting to, the, to another. And here's a drawing of that Cupid. To life with apples and oranges.
Here again, he's used drapery more extensively as a way of complicating the space or blurring between two and three dimensional design. One thing I want to say about this is I'm interested in this shape of the drapery here. It's a little bit like a kind of Mont Saint Victoire mountain shape. Maybe there's some cross fertilization between his work in different genres, you know, between his work in landscape and his work in uh, still life or his work in portraiture. Maybe he's learning from how you approach a landscape to how you approach a still life, for instance. Let's look at a portrait. Portrait of Vollard. Vollard is an art dealer. In fact, he's the art dealer gave Cezanne his first proper large-scale exhibition in 1895, quite late on in his life already. Well, these artists were really quite marginal in their own time. He's painted by a number of other artists as well. Renoir, Picasso, Bonnard, Maurice Denis, Raoul Dufy. Quite thinly painted. You can see that from... Oh, sorry. Um, this... Sorry. From this part of the painting here, the knuckles, that area, some of the white of the canvas still shows through. So thin layers of paint. Uh, some areas of the painting like that not quite covered yet, even though he spent a long, long time working on this painting, almost obsessively, almost neurotically, coming back again and again, working again and again. And we know quite a lot about this particular painting because um, the sitter, being someone who's well informed about art, decided to write retrospectively a little bit about what, a, what his experience was of being a sitter for Cezanne. Um, we know that he took uh, something like, well, more than 150 sittings with the model before he sort of gave up really and that was, he wasn't going to do any more. It wasn't even necessarily finished at that point. And after a, about 115 sittings, he said, apparently, I'm not displeased with the shirt front. You know, that's about the only bit that he was feeling happy with, this bit here. It's a constant readjustment, reworking, but without letting the painting become very heavily built up on the surface. I think working very, with very thin layers of paint it allows you to, the paint will dry more quickly, then you can rework it sooner perhaps. Nowadays you could work with, um, with acrylic paints which dry you know, potentially much more quickly unless you uh, add, add things to them to, to prevent that. But oil paint characteristically takes longer to dry out. That's a not necessarily a bad thing. You, you, you know, a lot of artists use that possibilities with oil paint that you can rework, rework before it is finished drying out. Vollard also says that um, Cezanne told him to sit like an apple. Again, we have this idea that you know you can learn in doing one kind of work from another kind of work. From a you know, he's treating. Uh, Vollard as if he were a still life object, in other words, you know, treat a portrait, a task of portraiture as if it were a still life task. I think, it, you know, you do actually get something of Vollard as a personality coming across. It's not just that he's treating him as forms. On the one hand, this is a kind of modernistic thing, you know, treating 
looking at a painting and, and you see a formal uh, arrangement, you know, he, he clearly he's very interested, like, say, in this sort of diamond shape, and it's echoed the diamond shape of the crossed knee mounting here, or, you know, picking up the same angular shapes in his hairline, the bow tie, and uh, all this sort of thing, lapels are picked up. You know, you, you, you can see him thinking in terms of formal arrangement, elbows, and so, all this. Uh, but he is also interested in the personality, too. Even the most naturalistic artists, the least modernistic artists, making a, a portrait or a figure study, a life class study, at some point you have to forget that it's a human being and just think of it as a shape, a, a thing with a certain shape to, to it. You know, you know, that's sort of natural part of the inevitable part of the process of making a painting. At some point you. You have to forget the humanity of the of your sitter uh, temporarily, at least. Even if you bring that humanity out in the final image that you, you, you come up with. Well, an obvious comparison, so I will make it, is that with Picasso's portrait of Vollard, made a few years later. This is 1909 to 10. So uh, uh, right in the heart of Picasso's cubism. And I think you can see that it has something in quality, uh, something of a quality in common with Cezanne's version, that, that they, the both of them, even the personality of the sitter seems a little bit similar, <laughs> the way it's projected. Uh, and actually, not, it's not always that uh, every other artist who's painted Ballard pr pr brings out the same personality. Renoir's is, is a little bit different. But the concern with form for form's sake is there in uh, Picasso. Really, he's learned a lot from Cezanne. He talks about Cezanne as is really his only, um, the father of us all, my one and only master, he says about Cezanne. Even the fragmented planes of cubism is a little bit like the patchwork quality of Cezanne's brushwork. So, so much of a legacy from Cezanne to, to, to cubism. Yeah, here's Ren Renoir's vision of Vollard, a very different character, this sort of roly poly kind of guy. Back to Cézanne. A theme that comes up in his late work is bathers. Uh, there's a number of works, some of them quite large, in which he treats this theme of bathers, nude female figures in a in a landscape, and treated in this very monumental way, very abstracted way. The nude, the female nude, erotic themes are there very much in his earlier work, but he sort of suppresses that um, in the middle period. You know, we've just been looking at the eroticism coming in a very detached way via the image of a, a cupid statue uh, in, in a painting. Uh, but in this later period work, somehow it's allowed back in because now he has a style that can counterbalance the, the raw emotion of his earlier work. So therefore this potentially quite erotic subject is allowed back in because there's a, a, a way of kind of, uh, of uh, con controlling some of its nuances. This is uh, then of the last few years of his life. This one is from the National Gallery in London, one of the main examples. And I'll show you one other, which is the Philadelphia one. <coughs> Quite a large image. These multi-figured paintings are quite large. The size of the National Gallery one changed 
while he was working on it, he added an extra bit of canvas at the top. You can see it's now become visible, paint thins, oil paint thins over time, and the drawing is, is kind of visible. The trees are very important in both works to give structure to the to the image and the figures become aligned with the forms of the trees. Same thing here. It's a very triangular static composition. Again, he's using very thin paint. It's an unfinished work, particularly this one. You see so many areas untouched by paint. <coughs> Some parts of the image, again, particularly this one, are, are very strange and look really towards cubism and its fragmentation of the human figure in a more aggressive or systematic way. Um, I think if you look at this, this part of the painting here, that's the most strange thing. You see buttocks, legs and buttocks of a figure, uh, then you see a face and arm, you almost want to read this as her breast or something, but it's also buttocks of another figure. Two figures seem to interpenetrate at that point. Lack of clarity of detail because things are not finished. I don't think I know what's really going on here and I'm not quite sure what's really going on here. On the other bank of the river. We can't see another. We can't see any other figures here. But the, in this painting too, the, the the gaze of the figures are into depth and they're gesturing towards another bank. You know, some yearning or interest in what's going on in the depth of the painting that we can't see. In this case, we can see. He's not really working from a model anymore. He had done so in earlier phases of his life. So these are more constructed from drawings and from memory, I think. He was fairly, I mean, he, he, I, I think there was some story about him not wanting the, uh, the neighbours to gossip if, a, if a, a young lady were to come to his home to pose in the nude or something. You know, some kind of prim and proper attitude about things. Um, I think he didn't like people to t physically to touch him as well. He's very um, withdrawn in that sense. The subject matter of figures in a landscape setting, except especially nude figures in a landscape setting, brings up uh, associations to earlier art, uh, to the 17th century, and particularly to the work of Poussin, an art French artist who was, a, you know, even today is renowned as someone who's very ordered in his approach to painting. So there is a certain kind of revisiting of the subject matter of, of Baroque or even Renaissance art. You, know, you could find a Titian painting in which there are nudes in a landscape setting as well. But to me, without any sense of the mythological narrative, which is so much a part of uh, Poussin's work, it alludes to those narratives, but it doesn't really enable you to um, 
to, to, to say that there is any story. Something may be going on. What are, what are they doing apart from bathing? Of course, they've been bathing, but they're looking at something. What are they? What is interesting them? We don't know. I'll just show you briefly a few few more works. That's the end of my kind of chronological sequence and the main points I want to make about Cezanne. But to show you a few more, here's a single nude figure study. The woman with the coffee pot. Strangely between sitting and standing, somewhere in between the two almost. Like the point I made about the uh, card players, you know, s a lot of verticals that are slightly off vertical, you almost want to come in to set things right, emphasizing the vertical, you know, the way the spoon sits in the coffee cup or the elongation of it all, verticality, the flatness of, of the tabletop as if we're looking down on it from above emphasizing the vertical line of the pleat, uh, the, um, well, against the diagonals of the pleats and of her elbows, her, the way she's got her arms. That very strong vertical here, carried all the way down her dress. Face a little bit mask-like and impassive. A lot of the sitters that he painted were people where he has an emotional distance with them and a social distance to you know, people who are his servants around his home, his gardener, and so forth. Uh, Vollard is a bit of an exception in that respect. I'm just going to move quickly past some of these and uh, decide not to talk about them again. The lake at Annecy. Well, blue predominates, as it often does in his, his work here. The water surface seems so solid almost like he's gouging lines in it when he represents the reflections. Exaggerating them, surely. Linking the, the again, the, the branches of the trees, foliage of the trees with the background mountainscape. Woman with rosary. There is a human interest there. It's not purely a formalistic thing. But social distance as well as emotional distance. And his gardener, again, you know, someone who's in his employ. It's, it's very different from most situations of portraiture. A lot of artists are making portraits as a main source of income. You know, you make you make someone's portrait. You better please them. You better produce something that makes them look pretty, makes them look um, noble, whatever. But if it's your employee, then you can make a figure painting, perhaps without too much worry about that. Here's an example of Cezanne's watercolor. It's the first one I've shown you. When we see some of those oil paintings and notice areas of the painting left bare white, possibly that's some kind of influence from his watercolour paintings where you, you, it's more common to use the, the bare white surface and allow it to show through. Although they're technically they're very different, but uh, two mediums, but um, maybe some mutual influence. In his watercolors, he tends to rely a lot on drawing. You know, there's a kind of he specifies some of the main accents with with line, with pencil, and then patches of 
colour, just as uh, in his oil painting, applying in patches, building it up in that way. always so difficult to tell whether something is finished or just abandoned. An unfinished look could be there in a work which actually is finished, but maybe it is unfinished. The subject matter of death, which is there in his early work, coming back in a mediated way in the form of the skulls in some of the latest still life. We saw the skulls in his studio in that photo. Death, but death somehow tamed of some of its rawness as a subject. And some of these early um, landscapes like this, the melting snow at Lestat from around 1870-71, there's a kind of expressive energy which is, I, I think it's sort of equivalent to something you might find in a painting by Van Gogh or even later painter like the folk painter of La um, <coughs> Portrait of Choquet. Choquet was an important patron for Cezanne. Actually discovered by Renoir. Renoir also paints a uh, portrait of Choquet. Renoir generously introduced the collector to Cezanne's painting and later to Cezanne himself. Cezanne made this uh, portrait of him, close up of his head, but then also this seated portrait. In fact, at this moment in time, there is also a Cezanne portrait of Choquet in Hong Kong. Has anyone seen it? If you went, uh, you had a chance over the weekend to see uh, such a painting in the Sotheby's auction previews. I think it's too late now, right? <laughs> but um, this is something when I first started teaching here, which was never a possibility at all that uh, you could just wander downtown and see a Cezanne painting. But now, I think at least four times a year you can see a Cezanne uh, or a Monet or a Picasso. You can pretty much guarantee to see a Monet and you pretty much guarantee to see a Picasso uh, in spring and autumn Sotheby's auction. Uh, they don't normally sell Western art here, but they do bring a few works from their New York and London auctions for uh, to show here in case some local buyers might want to bid. Um, then Christie's spring and autumn auctions. And then um, there's also at the moment the Asian art fair. And there was at least uh, some Monet and uh, other uh, 19th century French painting there. So 19th and 20th century Western art you can see. There was an El Greco <laughs> in uh, Sotheby's this time. You never know what will turn up. Because it's usually not the very best works. The very best works are already in museum collections um, and, and uh, rarely would come to the sale market. But I, I urge you to make the most of those opportunities to see uh, art directly. It's just something, uh, there's also the Art Basel of course, every spring now, massive showing of contemporary art. You can see almost any contemporary art in artists in Art Basel. There's so much you can notice if you're looking at the originals that you, it's hard to get from illustrations. Here, um, yeah, there's very, very much the knitting together in this seated portrait of Shockey of all the forms of it. This is a, his desk, the wooden panelling of his desk and uh, knitting together the different forms just as his hands, the fingers are knitted together. It's almost like a clue to how he must interpret the whole painting. The, 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 the design. Oh, just to, yeah, put together Cezanne's paintings with the, someone has gone and photographed faithfully the actual motif. Normally I, I don't, I kind of look down on this kind of approach to, uh, to paintings, but sometimes it helps. OK, 
Okay, so we have time to make a start in looking at the work of Sura, the last of the post-impressionist artists we want to, to look at. Born in 1859, lived till 1891. Well, immediately you notice it's a very short life. He, he died in a flu epidemic, so a career cut short. We can think of him as a post-impressionist. He's of that generation, and possibly he's the first one to come to a mature post-impressionist style, although very often people use the word neo-impressionism to describe uh, his style, new impressionism, literally. I suppose to, to indicate that in some ways his art is a little bit closer to impressionism than that of Van Gogh, Gauguin, uh, uh, and Cézanne. He takes the impressionist concern for light and color, luminosity, and he kind of eliminates the spontaneity of it, the intuitive nature of the Impressionist approach, introduces a more composed or ordered attitude to image making, a more intellectual, almost one wants to say scientific approach to image making. A feeling that somehow Impressionism had become too, was too spontaneous, too informal, that so much was lost with that. Uh, you could even call what he's doing a new kind of classicism in a way. He had an academic background training, uh, which we'll see influences his whole approach to image making. Because he has a very, he's very much associated with his own particular method, which is this uh, introduction of a kind of very systematic dot-like application of paint, a pointerless style as some it's called, or divisionism, dividing color up into little pure dots of, uh, of pigment which then blur together from the appropriate viewing distance, makes sense in your, uh, in when they blur together in your eye. Um, a number of other artists adopted his method, it became quite popular, but very few of them made a success of it that could be in any sense compared to what he did. So actually, in a way, this methodical approach is potentially a very arid approach to art making. And what makes Seurat a su success as an artist may not be that method that he came up with. It may be something else. It may just happen to be a great artist who was using one very particular method. Or perhaps that what was developed as a method uh, actually becomes a stylistic mannerism in its own right and then that happens to be of interest to us. Quite a lot of the later artists who go through adopting his style later abandon it or they um, use it in a kind of decorative way. That's the case, for example, we'll see when we look at the work of Matisse. Very short career because of his uh, early death and because he, he, he works so such a long time on, on the, his major canvases. There are actually only a few really major works that he produced uh, in the whole of his uh, working career. Impressionists made use of colour, um, valued colour much more than it had been valued in the academic tradition. Uh, the reason the academic tradition had not valued colour is because it was very untheorised, unlike, say, space, perspective was well theorised, or the study of anatomy was well theorised. Uh, it was a sort of an intellectual pursuit that you could study in art school, but colour was a bit different. But then during the 19th century, you start to see colour becoming the subject of scientific uh, investigation. And Surya is one of the first artists who really picks up on that and kind of starts to approach colour, not intuitively as the Impressionists did, but 
in a more quasi or pseudo scientific way. So let's just look a li little at some of his early work. I think we just have time to do that. Some background se sense of his formation as an artist. So here's a little um, male nude study, um, student work if you like, just to remind us that he was an artist with an academic training. He studied in the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the major art school in Paris. He was a pupil of a pupil of Ang, so he, you know, part of a very seriously important lineage. Uh, his his teacher was called Liman, L-E-H-M-A-N-N. -N. Not so important an artist himself, but the lineage he belongs to is important. So static su studies of figures po in poses, um, concern with light and dark, all these sort of tonality, this, uh, all the imbibing the academic method. You know, here is Arc's own um, study of a, the male nude, a, a painted study. Uh, so, you know, it's not so different really what his pupil's pupil is doing when he studies. So that's a background which stays with him and distinguishes him uh, uh, really from uh, Van Gogh or for, from Gauguin. These, uh, everything comes out the same size on this screen, but uh, what we're looking at here is a relatively tiny painting, a little sketchy study. So it may look very informal, but maybe that's appropriate to its size and to its status as, as a sort of sketch rather than a finished exhibition work. In the academic mode of training, that is normal. You, you spend most of your time making sketches and studies and small-scale preparatory works. The Stonebreaker. Well, the Stonebreaker is a subject that was famously treated by the realist painter Courbet. So what we see, apart from his academic training, is actually quite a strong interest in the realist and Barbizon school artists. Stylistically, uh, it's already quite modern looking in its sort of angularity, block-like treatment, and there's this sort of quite systematic quality of the brushwork, the crisscross treatment, uh, a little bit like the way Cezanne introduces a sort of systematic quality at the level of the brushwork. It's spontaneous, but there's order uh, uh, as well and simplification going on. Or th this work, the farm women at work, it's uh, the work they're doing, well, well, they could be picking crops, but they, they look very much like the gleaners in the famous painting by Mie. So he's looking at the realist era of French art for inspiration, I think. Again, that sort of crisscross brushstroke, he's thinking about how to order things, and again, simplifying forms very much. Another s small painting, and painting his boat. Yeah, just giving you several uh, uh, examples to show uh, again, the sort of organizing quality of his brushwork. And this is the first of the paintings we'll be talking about, the bathers at, or bathing at Asnier, painted in 1883 to 4 although he then came back to it in 1887 and retouched it in his mature style. You can't see that really from this slide, but a little few areas of the painting, like around the hat and in the hat itself, he reworked in his mature pointless style, little dot-like touches of color, but he didn't systematically rework the whole canvas. So it's, a, it's a, a first example of a major attempt at a 
large multi-figure painting with extensive preparatory sketches made uh, but not yet showing the full development of his style. There were different kinds of brushwork in different parts of the painting. So there were these very systematic looking horizontal strokes representing the water. A little bit like the broken brushwork of uh, Amone, who also loved to paint water surfaces, but rather more neatly organized than Mone would have come across with. Uh, then for the grass, there's that crisscross quality of brushwork. He's, we've seen in the little sketches that we, we've looked at so far. Um, then for the, the flesh, there's uh, a, a different kind of brushwork altogether again, uh, building up layer of, of layer uh, of opaque brushworks scumbling effect, more smooth treatment than you're not aware of the individual brush strokes quite the way we are with the grass or the water surface. So together with the new pointer the strokes here, you can say four main kinds of brushwork, but nevertheless the, the, the image has a, a great deal of coherence to it and that's certainly a great concern I, I think of the artist. figures in a landscape, a major attempt to deal with the, the question of how do you represent a multiplicity of figures in a landscape. Composition, when you've got so many figures and a painting really on this kind of scale, well, the projected image you are seeing is approximately the scale of the actual work itself. On that kind of scale you've got to do planning. You can't just sit, sit it up on an easel in front of a motif and paint. It's not, there, there was no such scene anyway that he's capturing almost like a snapshot photographer. It's a constructed, imagined, um, made up subject matter that you have to prepare in the studio. He's moved from landscape to the studio. Just at the level of the, the colours, I think it's very clear how organised things are. L note, for instance, how red is reappearing at various points across the painting. Red and orange. The dog happens to be an orange kind of dog. Uh, the, everyone's wearing either red hats or red trunks. Or they seem to have, you know, be red-headed <laughs> people. <laughs> red hat bands, everything is, well, it's, this is not a uh, coincidence, this is a decision by the artist to how to organize things. Reds and, of course, red is a complementary of green, the color that is there in all the foliage. So very well organized and, and uh, in tonal terms also very organized, thinking in terms of lights and darks, um, a lot of black and white, this hat has a black band. This is a black hat. He's wearing black trousers, black, black or dark brown boots, whatever. So very, very, very much thought out. And that takes time. Straight lines, verticals and horizontals of the, the structures of the factory in the background belching out pollution. This is modern life for you. We're not in Tahiti anymore. We're not in the beautiful landscape of Provence anymore. We're in Paris. This is the... We're dealing with modernity, modern life. This is what the Impressionists dealt with too, but when Monet started to go painting at Argentoy and saw the pollution from the factories there, he rapidly moved down steam to the stream to the more unspoilt parts of uh, the river, escaping from those problematic aspects of modernity. Well, for Sarah, he's happy to deal with that. He's taking on all that complexity, complexity of modernity, complexity of a world in which there are social classes. These are working people but they're also top-hatted bourgeoisie disappearing into the distance. They've got their own place of leisure somewhere else. 
So here's a abandonment of the spontaneity of impressionism. It's partly not just a stylistic thing, a technical thing, it's also a content thing, a meaning thing. It's about having a style that can bring into focus social issues, issues about the modern world, which otherwise it would be really hard to deal with in that very even vision of, of Monet where everything is the same, whether it's a human figure or a, uh, uh, reflections on the surface of water. It's just another thing that light is falling on. Well, somehow that style is insufficient if you want to engage with some of the difficulties about modernity, perhaps. That, at least, is what I think is going on here. So I've, I've made a start of looking at this painting, but uh, next week what we'll do, we'll look at some of the sketches and drawings that he made to see how he constructed it, and we'll move on from there.